you may all be seated. Welcome to worship, everyone. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Helen Pallas. I'm the pastor here at New Hope. I know you all are sorry, tired of hearing me say that, but if there's anyone who's worshiping with us for the first time online, it's good to let them know who all is here. And if you are worshiping with us online, leave a comment. Let us know that you're here. Be sure to like and subscribe to our page so that you know what's going on here at New Hope. And of course, if you are here with us today in person, don't forget to fill out your green sheet so that we know you're here, and I will pray over each and every one of you throughout the week. I have a couple of announcements. Kathy is gone today. She has been working on cleaning out her mom's house, and they're just exhausted. And so she asked, can Michael run the slides for me? For me? And I told her, well, he's not here, but I'm going to volunteer him for that responsibility anyway. So... Yeah, he's apologizing in advance in case he doesn't keep up with the, with the slides. As you, saw, as you maybe saw in the announcements, I'm going to be kind of on vacation from the July 4th to the 8th. We were planning on doing something in Yellowstone, but it flooded. So we're going to stay and do more of a staycation. So I'll probably be in and out of the office that week. But the following week, I forget what the dates would be on that, like the 10th through the... 14th or whatever. I'm going to be up in Mitchell, South Dakota. I am taking a leadership course next year, and that is our orientation period for that course, and so I have to go up there and get oriented at Dakota Wesleyan University. Then the rest of it will be online, so I only have to just go up there for a couple of days. I know that Kathy has some plans to be gone for a couple of weeks later in August, and we'll remind you all of that during that time. I will do my best to keep the office running while she's gone. I'm not making any guarantees because I rely heavily on her. And so if we make some mistakes in the interim while she's gone, I apologize. So as we gather to worship, I invite you to breathe in the longing for the living God. We hunger for God's holy presence, and we gather here as children of God, rejoicing in the promises that God has made to us. God of the universe, guide our steps. Join me in our call to worship. Break down the barriers that divide us, O oh God. Melt the barbed wire of anger and hatred. For we are called to newness in Christ Jesus. We are all brothers and sisters through God's love. Come, let us worship the God who removes obstacles from our paths. Let us praise God who seeks to unite us in peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Come, O oh God, be with us here. As much as a deer longs for streams of cool water, we long to know that you are with us. When trouble and sorrow come, we need you. Remind us that you are with us always and that your love is steadfast. Put your song into our hearts that we may praise you this day and help us to listen, not only with our ears, but with our spirits for your words of compassion and healing. Enable us to become more faithful disciples for you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Paul writes that there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male or female, for all things are one in Christ. So let us share our unity with one another as we greet this morning.
All right, join me in our first song of praise on 557 in your hymnal, also on the screen. Blessed be the tie that binds. Join me in our second song of praise on 428, also on the screen, for the healing of the nations. And the words will be different, but you should recognize the tune. As we prepare for our time of prayer, I want to remind you that you can write any prayer requests that you have on the green sheets. And if you are worshiping with us online today, you can add your prayer requests in the comments if you feel comfortable. Today we are lighting our prayer candle in honor of two separate prayer themes. We are honoring 
Father's Day, and we are honoring Juneteenth. And for those of you who don't know what the holiday of Juneteenth is or what we're celebrating specifically, um, there was a specific event in Galveston, Texas, two and a half years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation. The message of freedom had failed to reach about a quarter of a million enslaved people. And on June 19th, 1865, the news was finally brought to Galveston and every single person within the United States was finally set free long, long after the initial order was issued. So we are celebrating that today and we're celebrating Father's Day. So we have a lot to be praying for this, this morning. So join me in our prayer song as we get ready for our time of prayer. Help if I turn my microphone back on. Let us pray. We long for you, O oh God, as a deer longs for the flowing streams. And so many times we are afraid of what the future may bring. We separate ourselves from our siblings in Christ because they are different from us. When we pray, we don't always feel that you hear us. So we ask that you make your presence known with us. Heal the places of our doubt, despair, and alienation. Cure us from hatred and discrimination. Enlarge our hearts that we may recognize each person as a part of your beloved family. Tear down the walls of prejudice and racism that divide us. Grant us the vision to look at the stranger and see your face. Remind us of the things that divide us gender, race, economic and social status, religion and education are not important in your eyes. Cast out all that keeps us from you and from one another, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And as we celebrate the holiday of Juneteenth today, grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us resist the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere to the glory of your holy name. And today we also pray for fathers. We know that our relationships with our fathers can be complicated. For some of us, our father's love is like God's love enfolding us and wrapping us. For some, our dads are here. Some were never here. For some of us, God's love fills in the empty spaces our fathers left behind. All of us are shaped by the relationship or lack of relationship with our fathers. 
On this day when we remember what it means to have a father or to be a father, O oh God, we recognize the importance of fathers in our community. We ask that you love and nurture the fathers among us so that they will manifest your love in all that they do. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go into our time of offering, I remind you, as I always do, that your gifts change lives. Your work or your, you are the reason that the church is allowed to do the work that we do in this community. Remembering the strength of God's love and the promise of Christ's help, let us share who we are as the church in the world. With open arms, let us join one another as we express our faith through our gifts of love. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, there is a link in the description where you can give. You may all be seated. Our Psalter for today is Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. <coughs> All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, O oh Yahweh, you command your steadfast love, and at night your song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. 
I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise my help and my God. The word of life. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no longer male and female. (coughs) For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of God for the people of God. We have been having a lot of fun doing the children's moment after the service. I know y'all don't get to participate in it, but it's been a lot of fun. We have a lot. We can do a little bit more wiggling. We can do a little bit more, a little bit more goofing around. And so I have a magic trick that we're going to be sharing after the service today for the children's message. So this week, we are continuing our journey through some of Paul's letters to the early church. We've spent some uh, one week with the letter to the Romans. We're moving away from the Roman church over to the Galatian church, and they have their own problems. The church in Galatia was visited by missionaries who were Paul's rivals. These missionaries were Jewish Christian teachers who were urging the Christians in Galatia to adhere to certain Jewish laws, especially the laws surrounding circumcision and some of the food laws. Now, even though Paul is a Jewish man himself, he does not appreciate these teachings. His mission is to make the church open to all. So he writes this letter to remind believers in Galatia that Abraham's inheritance was given through God's grace, not through human obedience to the law. And Paul is not pulling any punches here. He is angry. He is angry that people have placed the law above the gospel. He even opens chapter 3. I, about, I laughed when I read this. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I'm like, ooh, Paul is he's mad. And he is letting them know that the inferior rule of law has been superseded by faith in Christ. And what's more, according to Paul, this has already happened. It's done And now it is time to live in the new world clothed in Christ. Now when we look at this argument that is taking place in the church in Galatia, it might seem a little insignificant to us. Jew or Greek, whether the church goers adhere to Jewish laws, it isn't a very important issue in our world. 
but it was important for the early church because they had distorted that promise that God had made to them by making it all about division. And when we look at it through that lens, through the lens of division, it becomes much more relevant to us today. We could even tweak Paul's words, especially in verse 28, to make the comparisons a little bit more relevant. Maybe it could say, there is neither native-born nor illegal immigrant. There is neither wealth nor working class. There is neither people of color nor white people. There is neither Republican nor Democrat nor independent. And because, unfortunately, the conversation around this hasn't changed much in 2,000 years, we can use Paul's own words and say, there is neither male nor female. Reading it like that shows us that Paul manages to offend pretty much everybody with this verse. And it gets really uncomfortable when we use a modern context to talk about the exact same kinds of problems that have not gone away in 2,000 years of Christianity. Because if you think about it, we thrive on labeling one another. We love to categorize people. We love to categorize our society. And as we are categorizing everyone, we begin to create these hierarchies. Our society drives us through what we call healthy competition. But if we think about it, how healthy is that really? When we base everything, especially our own self-worth on competition, we end up in an us-against-them kind of mentality. And then we use that mentality to look down on other people. One of the commentaries I read gave a great example, and I could immediately connect with it, sports fans. How many avid sports fans support their team so much they look down on the opposing team and on the opposing team's fans? How many fights have broken out over which team is the best? I know that there are some away games that are dangerous for Nebraska fans to attend. And I'll be the first to admit, I, I kind of fall into this thinking in my personal life too. You know, I look in the mirror, I see a few more pounds than I want, I'm like, well, at least so-and-so's got a bigger dress size than I do. <laughs> when we would get our grades at seminary, at the end of the semester, we would always compare, oh, make sure we did better than someone else. And why? What does it matter? You don't care what my GPA in seminary was. Michael pointed out that I missed an opportunity here. So in case you know, I graduated with honors just as a... <laughs> <laughs> But really, it doesn't matter. We are all unique and special in God's sight as we are. Why do we have to compete? Why do we have to feel like we need to be better than someone else to have worth? Because that's not what God's grace is about. We're not loved because we're better than someone else. We are loved because God has promised to love us as we are. And this all goes back to God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis. Now, Paul's rivals in Galatia would have the Christians there believe that they must adhere to Jewish laws because of God's covenant with Abraham. So Paul writes that once they belong to Christ, they are also heirs of Abraham. And it would seem like Paul is expanding that covenant to all of humanity. It seems like Paul is eliminating one group claiming God's promises, their exclusive birthright. And that seems like a great idea, right? Christ changes things to include all. But as I was reading this, I was like, hold on a minute. You might recall that we discussed last fall a bunch of covenants. And it's okay if you don't remember, it was a while back. I had to dig out the old sermons and look through them too. Back then we looked at the language God used when making the covenants to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God tells Abraham, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God makes it very clear that the promise and the covenant were not restricted to Abraham's direct heirs only, 
They are supposed to be agents to bring God's blessing to all. But of course, because the ancient people were humans just like us, humans who are prone to imperfection, humans who are prone to mistakes, they messed it up. And we still mess it up too. They twisted God's promise to Abraham to believe that only the heirs of Abraham received that promise. So by the time the Christian church comes along, there was this fight about who has supremacy in the hierarchy of God's world. So in order to push back against this behavior, Paul himself reminds the Galatians in verse 19 of chapter 3, we didn't read it, but it's just a few verses before our scripture starts, the law became as big as it was because of human transgressions. And it all got so bogged down in legal technicalities that it was nearly impossible to actually follow the law. I mean, there are 613 Levitical laws. And as the law expanded, it exposed the selfishness and the self-righteousness of the people. It uncovered their rebellion against God's will, the will that the people would bring God's covenant to all the earth, not just a select few. But of course, there's a problem with the law. For all it does to keep people following a strict path, it does nothing to make them holy. You cannot legislate goodness. That kind of change has to come from within, and it can only come when we accept God's grace. And for Christians, all Christians, Gentile and Jew, it comes through Christ. Christ is what matters. Christ is the beginning and the end. Nothing can keep us from the love and grace of Jesus Christ, not even death. And that faith supersedes the law. Now, unfortunately, we still struggle with this today. We still grapple with what it means to be a Christian and how to live a Christ-like life. One commentary had my favorite quote for the whole week. It was an incredibly powerful point about how we practice or fail to practice Christianity. The quote says, I'm going to try and do this exact, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. I was like, ooh, ouch, that's harsh but true. It's hard to really, truly follow Christ. And it gets even murkier when we listen to people who claim to be Christians say some fairly horrible things about other people in order to justify treating others with violence. We are still in this society trying to push people down based on the color of their skin, their gender, their country of origin. So let's go back and look at verse 28 again. We see these dichotomies, and Paul is telling us that these categories don't matter anymore. But also notice that even after everyone is clothed in Christ, they still maintain their identities. The women are still women. The Greeks are still Greek. The slaves, unfortunately, are still slaves. They didn't transform all of a sudden out of this unique image of God into something completely different. And that's not Paul's point. Paul's point is that through Christ, our human barriers are torn down. Our divisions, our systems of ranking are upended and destroyed. Christ's coming is the end of bias and bigotry and hatred and segregation. You think we're there yet? It's true. We have certainly failed to live up to this ideal. But the more we emulate this, the closer we get to God's realm on earth. I think it's incredibly appropriate that this lectionary scripture falls on the holiday of Juneteenth. The day that we celebrate finally the freedom of slaves throughout the entire country of the United States which is, I said, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation has passed. But 
humanity did not want to give up power and fall into patterns of equality easily. Last week, I took the boys to a baseball game, so of course we had to watch A League of Their Own. It's one of my favorite baseball movies. And of course, the overtones of women's rights are very clear in the movie, but there was also a scene that showed how equality for women did not mean all women. As the women baseball players were practicing, the ball flew out of the field area and a black woman stepped up and picked it up. The woman who was playing catcher was just a few feet away from her and she said, you know, come throw it to me, throw it to me. And the black woman decided instead to throw the ball across the entire field over to the outfielder on the opposite end of the field. She had thrown the ball so hard that the outfielder had to take her hand out of her glove and shake it because of the amount of pressure that the ball made hitting that glove. She was clearly a skilled ball player. But she was not invited to play on that field because of the color of her skin. It took another 20 years to finally pass civil rights, at least on paper. 100 years after the abolition of slavery, they finally ratified the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And I'm sure that we can agree that we are still fighting for that equality today along racial lines, or along gender lines, along political lines, income lines, on and on and on. We could stand here all day listing everywhere we fight for supremacy. But the good news is that there is hope. There is always hope. God is an endless source of grace and hope for us. As Christians, it is our task to take up this work and make a difference in this world. And I know that that's not easy. There will be days, there will be many days when we just want to throw in the towel. I'll be honest, I struggled with that this past week. I was treated quite poorly by another person. And I just wanted to quit. I wanted to quit leading the way I wanted to take the hate and the vitriol that was being thrown at me and throw it right back at him. I did not want to live what Jesus taught us to do unto others as we would have them do to us. I wanted to do back what she was doing to me. But that's not what Christ teaches us. And I'm not going to lie, I haven't always managed to rise above and live live up to that ideal. None of us are perfect. We are all going to fall short. The ancient people mess it up. We mess it up. But we don't need to let that stop us from getting up and trying again. We don't need to let that stop us from accepting God's grace and mercies every single day. That old prayer of God of second chances, here I am again. Faith is like taking a shower. You can't do it once and be done. We need to keep coming back to God every single day, day after day. We need to keep renewing our commitment to God through prayer, through study, through worship. We need to grow in our faith, grow closer to God. We need to practice trusting God over and over again so that we will be ready to take our place and go into this world and make it better. Will you pray with me? Living God, ruler of all things seen and unseen, you call us to yourself so that we may live in wholeness with ourselves and our neighbors. But too often we have compromised our souls with a complacent disregard for your words that we are all one in Jesus Christ. Unchain us and set us free to rejoice in your saving word. Let Paul's prodding burst us out of our complacency. Let the Spirit energetically reveal us as those who are saved by grace, jubilantly clothed in Christ, new creations from the inside out. Help us proclaim your life-giving truth to the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Join me in our final song, One Bread, One Body, on 620, also on the screen.
in the spirit of God's unchanging love, live the stories of faith we have heard this day. In the melody of God's song within us, sing the faith we have received this day. In the hope of God's unfailing help, share the grace we have touched this day. Go into the world clothed in Christ. Amen.